the question we were left with in the last episode was how it is possible that reasonable human beings want to live at lower living standards and with less freedom. We owe that to the fraud in the designs of our psychological system. We human beings are not as reasonable as some might think. In fact, our psychology was designed much for the 15-minute fight or flight decisions, not for improving our living standards and maximizing our freedom through long and persistent efforts. Let me use two examples to illustrate the point. First, we'd rather be poorer if our richer neighbors could be made poorer more. This is widely understood by the elite. For instance, one bank CEO, after decrying inequality, paid himself more than thirty million dollars a year. He was betting on the ignorance of those who listened to what he said and would not bother to check what he did. With the entire society proceeds this way, after a while, you would find all public figures speaking unfathomable gibberishes as they go after the psychology of their subjects rather than reason. The worst, of course, would be the professional politicians. After lying to the people who were supposed to be their masters, they want to get themselves paid more than the bank CEO. One of the easiest way for them to get rich is to sell American interests to foreigners, or better yet, foreign powers. So you should not wonder why they hate any policy putting the interests of the American people first. The desire for the so-called equality at the cost of losing one's own interests could go weird quickly. The socialist exercises of the Soviet Union and China were examples. Where people actually got their equality, with the exception, of course, of the official class, which amassed enormous power for their own benefit. Officials did not care when tens of millions of their subjects died of hunger. The interesting point here is that the so-called intellectuals, as a whole, are almost always the worst infected with this problem. They would rather lose their own freedom in exchange for that guy who runs the local restaurants or some other businesses to lose more. Yes, they always support higher taxes, especially higher taxes to the rich. On this, they actually have a reasonable ground, as they are not hired by the rich but by the government. The weird result is that the intellectuals could not wait to lose their rights, such as their free speech rights. That's why political correctness is practiced most fervently in today's universities. Before the communist takeover in 1949, that was precisely what happened in China. The intellectuals overwhelmingly supported the communists. After the communists took over. It quickly eliminated any intellectuals against the communists. Soon, nine years after the takeover, Mao Zedong started a political movement to essentially force intellectuals to criticize the communists. It lasted only a few months. All those who did the criticizing, mostly suggesting changes to make the Communist Party more efficient, were summarily labeled rightists and persecuted. With many sent to labor camps to die. By the end of the 1960s, after repeated political movements, the only survivors were those who saw through this all from the beginning. When forced to criticize the communist government, for instance, they would say the government had no problem. The only problem was with themselves. When some such famous intellectuals died. Such as Shen Chongwen in 1988, one of the most famous writers prior to the communist takeover, the propaganda machine known as media in the West did not report for a long time because it did not know how. Second, after a long period of prosperity, people tend to become complacent. I would rank complacency as the number one cause for the downfall of civilizations. We human beings have gone through so many already, from Iraq to Egypt to Iran to China, 
Take a look at their histories. They were all once flourishing civilizations. People could be complacent for next to nothing. In China, since 1989, the propaganda line has been that the Communist Party has proudly taken away people's rights because it has successfully fed them. The communists have never bothered themselves with the backward logic, as it is the people who have fed the communists, whose wealth often counts in the unit of tens of millions of U.S. dollars. It must have been the envy of the American politicians. Interestingly, oftentimes the people who do the everyday arguing in China are the average people, not the party officials. In America, when corruption was alleged, of course those in charge of corruption would not do anything politically incorrect. The people are so complacent that they could not be bothered with it either. If you have lived in China for a while, you would be frustrated to see the people openly argue on behalf of the corrupt communists against their own interests. Reciting the official line is what ignorant people do. All those who could not be bothered. Would do the same sooner rather than later. In China, the propaganda line has been that the Chinese people are uniquely hopeless or stupid, so that Western democracy, as opposed to the Chinese-style democracy, is not fitting to the Chinese people. I suspect that the party line will soon become that all people are hopelessly stupid, not suitable for democracy. All power should be left to the government. On the other hand, ironically, the propaganda line has always said that China has always been the greatest country with the highest quality people. Without the fear of being challenged and with a complacent people, weird things are dime a dozen. As I have said, what I really like about America is the naivety. People do not think that those in the establishment would play dirty tricks, such as practicing violence and then blaming it on anyone who dared to stop their power-grabbing progressivism. Democracy functions by allowing people to say no to the progress towards totalitarianism. The founding fathers designed the independent judiciary to protect that. I'm not going to rehash the arguments of the founding fathers here. But if the judges were engulfed by the political correctness, you would have every politician running on the platform of change. But they would invariably change in the wrong direction until democracy is completely lost. That could happen within one generation. Complacency comes in many forms. The most common one is that people who care about nothing beyond right now could not be bothered. We're not going to talk about the not caring part. This time around, we're only going to talk about the cannot be bothered part. The drugs of today are computer games and social media, which have trained people not to bother with anything down the road. They could not be bothered to study any marketable skill, as it takes too long, typically five to ten years. They could not be bothered to read Hayek, as that will take too long also. Especially when they are not used to read reasonable deductions, they could not be bothered if their private information is sent to the Chinese communists, who have been consistently declaring America as their number one enemy since 1949. They could not be bothered because the damages are not immediate enough. They could not be bothered when political speeches of others were censored. They just want changes and could not be bothered to dig into the politicians' change rhetoric. For today's content makers, we are warned to keep the programs short. Complacency assures that people take the full damages of our psychological design defects, allowing thieves to steal from right under everybody's nose. So now, when we finally talk about fading away or escapism, the Chinese style, please do not get this wrong. It is not a retreat from the principles, but rather a strategic move to protect our precious principles. 
we individuals have very limited powers against the organized mass. So it is more of a recognition of reality, and the attempt to make the best of it than giving up our principles. It may be difficult for young people, who are at the front of this fight towards socialism, to understand this. That for people at a certain age, there is this sense, and indeed the reality, that the fight is behind them, that their bodies could not support the fight against the overwhelming reality. So, for some individuals, the wise move is to fade away, as we shall see in these programs. The Chinese escapists produced beautiful artwork. I hate escapism as much I admire the American can-do naivety. That's probably why I admire the last Don Quixote president, who thought that he could make a difference and went for it. It was a pity that he was stupid enough to allow the fraud that he claimed that he had known all along prior to the election day to run its course without interfering, sitting in the chair of the country's chief law enforcement officer. I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he was reading the same escapist thoughts that I'm now talking about. He could not be bothered to enforce the law. I'm not sure whether Trump would fight on as he keeps claiming, or fade away as he has been doing since the election day. But I'm fading away to use a Chinese phrase to become the leftover old man from the previous dynasty, the dynasty formed. By the founding fathers, Jefferson, Hamilton, an immigrant nonetheless, at all. Like I've said, fading away could be a smart move. For instance, Churchill should have faded away after he lost to Clement Attlee. He should have worked on developing his painting. It is a pity that he didn't. In our next episode, we will take a journey of fading away through the Chinese paintings. I'll see you then.